you know, the sense of balance. And that's, as we see in this diagram, is very much associated with your sense of hearing. So we saw here uh, the eardrum and uh, the, the ossicles and, and the otoliths and the cochlea. And here, okay, we have the balance system. This, is, this whole thing is the balance system, and that's what we'll talk about today. Now, the reason these two things are close together, well, first of all, what, 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 does it, what, is, it, what is it composed of? Uh, well, it's, it's also called the otolith, uh, and, you know, and the labyrinth, I should say. And it's called the labyrinth because it's, it's like a labyrinth of tunnels inside the bone. Um, so you have bone here and uh, this tunnel inside uh, containing uh, liquid. And then you have um, a membrane between the bone and the, 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 the thing that contains the liquid. Um, and on one, on, on one side, you have a perilymph and then the membrane itself. And the perilymph, um, the, the inside uh, the, 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 the canals themselves, or these are semicircular canals, and the rest of the structure, you have something called endolymph. And um, you remember endolymph was the, was the stuff that contained the high concentration of calcium, um, potassium, I should say. Um, that was entering the hair cells of your auditory system. Well, we'll, we'll see that the same thing is happening here. You have a high potassium. And this high potassium bays the hair cells that you have in this system as well. And the other thing that wasn't mentioned last time, but it's important to know, is that the envelope has a charge, and it's plus 80 millivolts compared to uh, the, the, the baseline. Now, the reason both these things are close together is because they developed in, in, in early fish in terms of what's called the lateral line organ. And this lateral line organ is a series of tubes along the length of the fish, and through these tubes, water would flow. So as the fish moved, a liquid would flow through these tubes, and the fish uh, uh, sensed its movement. Um, it could also, if, if uh, there were uh, sound waves in the water, that, that those waves would would go through these tubes, the pressure waves, and also activate the sensors inside uh, the, the, the lateral right organ. And so this one system had both the ability to detect sound and detect the motion of the fish. And uh, over the years, it separated and became two different systems, but in close anatomical uh, uh, space to each other. Now, the otoliths contain two parts. One of them are these things called canals. They're called canals because they're like a donut that, that sort of has a break here in the middle. Um, and another donut, and a third donut, three different donuts. And those donuts sense your turning. So, um, rotations. Uh, so that, that's different from uh, what the other part senses, 
because these are the odorless. And the odorless senses your movement in the straight line. In this case, the subject is moving forward. It could be moving up and down or left to right. All these movements uh, are translations. And the same thing with the canals. You can ro be rotating in any of three dimensions. I can be rotating about uh, uh, the vertical axis, but I can also be tumbling or I can be rolling. So uh, again, there's th these structures have to me measure all three possible uh, axes about which we, can, we move. The other thing that the uh, that sense is gravity, which way is down. That's important to know when you're trying to do something like standing on your hands um, to be able to balance yourself. Now, within the odorless, you have two sort of egg-shaped structures, spheres. And each sphere has a little part that's thicker. And that's called the mac macula. And uh, that out, out of that macula, you've got these tiny little hair cells, the same ones that you saw in the auditory system. And so you can imagine this, this blue area here is covered with a forest of hair cells. And the same thing with this green area here on the utricle. Now, the hair cell is, is in, in the case of the odolites, embedded in something like jello. And on that jello, somebody sprinkled little stones, they called ear stones, to make it made of calcium carb carbonate. Um, and the reason for those stones is to add weight to this jello. Now, the importance of weight is that when this, when you move, this, the weight of these ear stones helps, keeps, keeps this in place. And so that bends then the hair cells, your movement bends the hair cells. It gives extra mass. There's also, we didn't maybe mention with the hair cells, in the ear, um, like the, they have a crew, 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 sort of a crew cut, and the tallest one is called the condylium, and we'll see that that's important um, to define what direction this thing's facing. Now, again, as in the the, the hearing system, um, this potassium flows into the openings that are formed whenever these hair cells bend. And that potassium then uh, raises the potential inside the, the cell, and that in turn produces transmitter, and that transmitter fires the, this, this nerve here, the green one here, that um, then um, sends a signal to the brain. Now, you can see here that uh, when, when the head moves, um, these hair cells bend because of the rocks placed on top of them. And so you can measure how much movement your head is making. You also can notice, if you watch this activity down here, that's the 
um, firing rate of the hair of the hair cell is that it's never silent. It's always got a cons at least a constant rate of about a hundred action potentials per second, and bending one way will reduce that. Bending it the other way will increase that. Now you can see here that uh, not only is translations of the uh, bends the hair cells, but bending your head does as well. Um, as you bend your head, the weight of these rocks bends the hair cells, and again, that senses which way down is. Now, I mentioned that you had a whole forest of these hair cells on the, 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 this, this what areas here, the green and the blue areas. And this, but the forest is, is not random. The, the hairs in this forest have different directions to them. So this arrow here, the end of the arrow, signifies where this panacillium is. The, 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 this, this hair is oriented in this direction here and in another direction there. And the, the green part here in the utricle is over here in the horizontal plane, the plane of your table. So you can imagine all the hairs sticking out of your table. And then the hairs, when you, if you were to move your table, could be bent in the forward or backward direction, or from side to side. Okay. Now, in contrast, the blue area in the saccule is uh, attached to what would be the, the side of your table. Okay, so all the hair cells are sticking out of the side of your table. And so they would be sensitive to movements up and down and forward or backwards. If you move the table from side to side, that wouldn't uh, uh, displace the hairs, okay? They would, because that wouldn't displace the jello. The jello is just sensitive to motion in the plane that they, they're mounted. But with that, um, with those hairs in all different directions, you can sense motion in any possible direction. Now the same is true for the canals. We've got three canals on each side, um, and they're approximately orthogonal to each other. Orthogonal means that um, if you were to, this would be horizontal, these two would be vertical, and you could place a cube inside here between all these canals. Uh, this one here would be the one side of the cube, this one here would be the other side of the cube, and the one the bottom against the bottom side of the cube. So they're all in at 40, uh, 90 degree angles to each other. Okay, so Inside each canal, you've got a widening, and that widening is uh, blocked by this thing called uh, your cupola. And in the cupola, so if, if this forms a seal, and inside the cupola, again, you've got hair cells. 
So this um, cupola is like um, a membrane that that blocks uh, fluid from one to the other. So as a consequence, when you rotate your head, fluid pushes against the, the, the cupola and then bends it accordingly. So if you turn in one direction, it causes an increase in activity. If you turn in the other direction, it causes a decrease in activity. Now, um, you've got all these different canals and they, 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 they sense motion. So for example, this one here senses motion horizontally. Anytime this is your right canal, I'll still think of the mirror image of, of looking at the face, okay? And so when this head turns right, this canal increases its firing rate. When I turn left, the opposite canal increases its firing rate. So they, they do the opposite thing. This one increases, at the same time, this one decreases. Now this one increases, at the same time, this one decreases. The other canals do the same thing. This canal gets active when you bend in this odd direction. It's not just forward, but it's forward in the direction of the right ear. Okay? So you bend your head forward and towards the one, one, no, one, not, not eye, I should say, rather than ear, the right eye. Okay? And then the, the opposite canal here, so this one here, when this one increases, the opposite canal here decreases. So this anterior canal increases, the posterior canal decreases. Then if I do the opposite, I bend my head in the opposite direction again, that canal increases and this canal decreases. Notice also no other canal is firing. Okay. or changing its firing rate. It's firing at a constant firing rate because motion is just in this plane. Okay. And, and the, the, the fluid isn't moving in any of the other canals. So it's only moving in the plane that you're turning. Now, so, so you have six canals, but they're arranged in sort of push-pull pairs. They've got partners. Uh, you've got uh, the two horizontal canals, and then the anterior and posterior canals are paired together on each side. And so that allows you to, you know, by examining how much each canal is firing, you can detect precisely how your head is turning in three dimensions. Okay. The reason for all that is, first of all, to be able to do things like be able to stand because balance to be able to balance you've got to be able to sense the motion of your body you want to know if you're tipping or turning or anything to be able to adjust your stance appropriately if you feel like you're falling forward you've got to contract your legs to resist that fall but the other thing that 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 this is involved in is something called the vestibular ocular reflex. And the purpose of this reflex is if your head turns in one direction, the eyes turn in the opposite direction, and the image at the back of the eye 
is stationary. Okay? So there's no retinal slip. And you can see clearly, if you try carrying your head back and forth and look out, look at the screen. You can still see the screen, everything on the screen clearly, even when you turn your head back and forth at, at a considerable speed. Now, the pathway for that is quite short. You have a signal coming from the, the canal that's being turned. It goes from this nerve to the vestibular nucleus, from there to motor neurons, which in turn contract this muscle on this side and this muscle on that side. So you can see here, when, I, when my head turns one way, the eyes turn in the opposite direction, the, the, the opposite muscle, the muscles that turn the eye. I'm turning to the right, the muscles that turn my eye to the left are being contracted. At the same time, when I'm turning to the right, the, the, the canal on the opposite side gets less active. So it's producing f less firing rate and it's then relaxing the, the opposite muscles. So these muscles relax and don't resist the rotation. Now, if everything works, your head goes one way, your eye turns the other way, and this is what you see, a stable image, everything clear. Now, if it isn't working, you see a slip here, and uh, that, 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 that generates an optokinetic reflex, which assists the VOR. So, okay, we need some exercise. I'd like all of you to stand and up. Okay. Then try standing up without falling by after raising one foot starting now okay not bad oh you're still up okay you can you can put your foot down okay now Try the same thing with your eyes closed. So first close your eyes, then raise your foot. Ooh, it's a lot more difficult. I see some people not being quite very stable, side, going from side to side. Okay, you can stop before we have an accident. <laughs> um, so you can see that uh, vision assists you. That vision is your optokinetic reflex, the reflex I just mentioned. Uh, it, you, you ha uh, when you had your eyes open, uh, you were quite stable, but you were being helped by vision. But you could still keep your, keep um, reasonably stable even with your eyes closed. So the vestibular system does quite a lot in, in maintaining your, your stability. Now, you can sit down now. Thank you. Uh, if you were, if these, these screens were a lot bigger or you're standing really close to them, you would also get unstable looking at these screens because 
the movement of these grains would give you a sense that you're moving and you get unbalanced as a result. Okay, uh, some hitting on the table problems. What modulates, what, what modalities contribute to maintaining your balance while standing upright? So you were trying to stand upright. Uh, okay, so the vestibular system, yes, no. Good. Uh, what about touch? No. Yes. You got from from touch. You can get, sense the pressure on, for example, the foot, the the um, uh, your foot pads. Okay, and you can sense that uh, your your uh, there's a, you're leaning in on a certain direction. Uh, proprioception. Yes, of course. You get you feel your muscles get stretched, and you're, uh, you resist that stretch. Vision. Yes, we saw with a close in the eyes that vision is a big contributor. And the auditory system. Well, maybe. Eh? So, sometimes you can use if you know that a sound is coming from a particular location. Uh, you can use that as a cue to your own movements. Okay, why do you get dizzy? You know, so so you go on a roller coaster ride or something like that, um, that Wonderland, and you get dizzy. Okay, why does that happen? Well, the reason that happens is that uh, we'll see here. When you move, it deflects. But notice that after a time, it comes back to its vertical position. So when you start turning, these things get deflected, and your vestibular system says that you're turning. But if you keep turning for a, a, a for several seconds, or several uh, for a minute, let's say, uh, you will sense these things will come back to its vertical position and your vestibular system will tell you that you're not turning. Okay. Now what happens if your eyes were closed? Your vestibular system would say, hey, I'm not turning. So I'll just hopefully be able to restart that. Yeah. Not so good. Does it restart this way? No. Anyways, um, what you saw here was that with, with when the eyes opened, this thing was moving. Okay? You got retinal slip because, again, your canals were saying, okay, I'm not moving. But when your eyes opened, you saw that you were. And this is what happens when we get dizzy. Um, we see open our, our eyes and we sense that uh, the world is moving uh, and uh, we feel dizzy. Now, generally, w your VOR isn't perfect. So every time you turn, you get a b little bit of slip and your uh, optic and system then kicks in, but kicks in very slowly, so it stabilizes it only after a little bit of time passes by. So you get a bit of retinal slip, but then the VOR or the optic and system kicks in and tells you that uh, uh, everything's or makes everything stable. But it takes a while. Also, the, the, this I've mentioned before, uh, when we're talking about uh, up, uh, MT and everything like that, is that when you're, for example, uh, stationary and you're sitting on, a, uh, let's say, a subway car 
and the subway car next to you starts to move, you sense that you're moving. So the signal from this optic energy system can mislead you into thinking you're moving when you're not. Now this signal that, that uh, is driving this optic connect system um, comes from MT and then it goes, remember, to MSTD, which senses what direction you're moving in, what direction the optic flow is coming from. The other part of MST told, talked about um, where objects are moving, a little like a, watching a, a, a basketball game or a tennis game, but the MSTD tells you how you're moving. So that's the signal that's driving that. And the two signals from the vestibular and the um, uh, MSTD then combine and go to the somatosensory cortex and give you the sense of self-motion. Now, normally these two signals combine, so, but they combine in different ways. The vestibular system, you, 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 it's, you start moving, it senses that you're moving, but gradually the pupil comes back to its normal position, as you see here. That's pushed, springs back, pushed, springs back. The visual system, it takes a while to kick in. So you start moving, um, it, 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 it takes a while. Under, I mentioned uh, earlier that it takes 100 milliseconds to get to MT. So it, that's why it takes some time to get going. But that's not bad because with this one going slowly, getting better, and this one slowly getting worse, if you combine the two, you get a perfect um, vestibular VOR. Okay? And that's how it normally works. Now, what's happening here? This ballet dancer is somehow avoiding becoming dizzy. And how is she doing it? Like she's turning continuously. So you would think that she's uh, going to get dizzy from this continuous turn. But there's something else that she's doing that preventing that. So one, is, it, is she suppressing the signal from her ear to the brain, from the vestibular system to the brain, so it doesn't get dizzy, learns from that? Uh, is, is, is she providing a fixation point for the eyes? There's nodding. I don't hear any tapping of tables. A little weak tapping of tables. Okay. Is she preventing her head from turning continuously? No. She is. I'll sl s slow it down. Notice how her body turns continuously, but her head tries to stay pointing forward and then flicks around. What? Okay. So she goes, she's stationary, then her head turns quickly and flicks back. Okay. So that makes her not stay turning continuously in one direction. Okay. And so, as a consequence, her vestibular system doesn't adapt. Sure, she's looking at a particular point in space to help to do that, but the real reason why she's not getting dizzy is because her head isn't turning continuously in the same direction. Okay, but why do you then get, um, not, some people get not only dizzy, but they have, they have a feeling of nausea. You get seasick or you get carsick. 
Well, that happens because uh, the, the brain gets these conflicting signals. And if it gets these conflicting signals, one reaction is that somehow you've been poisoned. And the way to get rid of, rid of this poison is to uh, vomit. Now, you, why, why is it that your signals are in conflict? Well, here is a man. He's standing inside. I suppose he's standing inside his cabin. Okay, his head is moving up and down, but the walls of the room are moving with him. The visual system tells him he's stationary, but his vestibular system tells him he's moving. So there's a conflict between the two. The way to avoid the conflict for this guy is to step outside. And so the vestibular system and his visual system are congruent. So the best way of getting rid of motion sickness is to go outside of the ship. The same thing when you're inside a car. If you sit in the back seat of a car and you read, that's the worst thing for getting car sick. Okay? Because you're, you're looking down, your head is bobbing up and down or from side to side, but you see a stationary image in front of you. Okay? And again, you get this conflict. The best way not to get car sick is to sit in the front seat of a car and look out at the visual scene. And again, the two signals are then congruent. Okay. Now, as you age, nothing, nothing stays perfect. So the perfect VOR would be, you know, if whatever you turned, the eye turned the opposite direction, and life, there's no, nothing, nothing wrong. But there's always malfunctions that would change the game, and you need some readjustment. Um, you could, for example, get a prescription, new prescription, if you wear glasses, and you change the prescription on your glasses by a large amount. You put on these new glasses, you'll feel dizzy initially. And that's because um, the, 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 the magnification of your glasses, it's like a prism. It, you know, your head, the, the image slips more when you turn your head than it used to. And you have to readjust the, the VOR as a consequence. You can also get, uh, you know, some uh, malfunction of your VOR. And then if you do that, this happens when you, for example, walk. Every time you walk, the image gets displaced on your eye. That's the retinal slip. And if that, for example, makes it very difficult to read any signs that you, this, there's a sign here on the wall, to read that sign while you're walking. Now, in most cases, when there's something wrong with the VR, some magic little system fixes it. And within a couple of days, your VOR adjusts and it becomes perfect again. Now, what is that system? That system is the cerebellum. Okay. And so you have here the, the pathway that we talked about earlier, that little short pathway. But there's another pathway that goes into the, the cerebellum. Here we have a, what's called the mossy fiber that uh, spreads out and becomes parallel fibers. These parallel fibers uh, make connections with this cell here called the Purkinje cell. This Purkinje cell is like, imagine a tree that got flattened. So all the branches here are in one plane, and the, 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 the parallel fibers 
connect them. And there's thousands of parallel fibers connecting to different parts of this Purkinje cell. And you have thousands of Purkinje cells to connect onto. And this Purkinje cell inhibits the VOR. Okay? So it decreases the activity. So the VOR is the difference between how much this thing uh, signals versus how much this thing reduces it. And any damage to the VOR gets adjusted accordingly. So when the VOR isn't working properly, you get retinal slip. And this retinal slip activates climbing fibers. And these climbing fibers are like a grapevine that encircles the tree branches. Okay? And if a parallel fiber makes contact with this particular cell, and if this rotation here causes an activity that is producing the retinal slip, you'll get a signal from here and here at the same time. And when they collide, that synapse will change in, in terms of its strength. So it'll adjust its strength. So, you can see the, what the steps are in the VOR. First, let's suppose something goes wrong with the VOR. Well, if something goes wrong with the VOR, you get retinal slip. Anytime you move your head, something will, will slip on your eyes. That then will cause the, uh, the, 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 the climbing fiber to fire and it'll then make contact with whatever vestibular afferent signal is, is, is being, is causing to whatever direction you're moving in. That will produce activity up here and the two signals will collide and an adjustment will be made. And when the adjustment's made, this retinal slip disappears and the VOR becomes stable. So that, that gain is then maintained. No longer, you don't need any more adjustments. So this cerebellum, you can think of it as a repair shop. And it does a repair of this VOR, but with the vestibular uh, ocular reflex. But it also repairs any other reflex that you have. And also, amazingly, does things like um, uh, correct mistakes in all your motor acts. So, for example, you're, when you're throwing, you're, the, the, your throw gets adjusted every time you make a mistake. Let's say you're aiming a dart and you, you hit the wrong point. Well, the next time, the cerebellum makes an adjustment and get closer. The next time you get closer still. Uh, the same thing happens when you're skiing. If you lean right and you fall, the, the, the cerebellum makes an adjustment so your skiing becomes better. And it does the same corrections to all your reflexes to make them as perfect as possible. Okay, that's it. We'll see each other next week.